My name is John Lobel. I teach architecture at Pratt Institute. This is a lecture on what Frank Lloyd Wright means by organic architecture. Given for my course on Frank Lloyd Wright at Pratt in the spring of 2014. So talking about Wright and organic architecture gives us a chance to sum up some of our key ideas and then also a way to look at how we can see architecture through a broader point of view. We can start with what does Wright mean by organic architecture and he uses the term in many different ways so there's no one way that he uses it and I'm going to suggest that the last one is the most uh, general but uh, we can mean integrated into and relating to the natural features of the site, use of natural materials, embodying the democratic American spirit, and architecture of essences, and an organic worldview. So let's start with integrated into the site and relating to its natural features. Just for contrast, we'll contrast right with Corbu, and I'm going to suggest that the first several of these understandings of organic architecture are limited. There's a technical term we use for a building that does not relate well to its site, namely bad architecture. So <laughs> all architecture should relate to its site. There's still something here, and that is, as we'll see as we go along, Perhaps Corbu sees his architecture as dominating the site, and Wright sees his as integrated into it. Now, Wright's architecture is still apparent. It isn't like he totally camouflages it and you don't notice it. But it's still, um, yeah, we know there's something different in the approach of these two. And when we talk about worldviews, maybe it'll become more clear. And then, we think of organic architecture as the use of natural materials. What's the problem with this description? Right. What would be an unnatural material? Plastic? It's made out of oil. It comes out of the ground. Oil is an organic compound. <laughs> okay. Use of natural materials. And here, let's contrast the Jacobs House by Wright with Mies van der Rohe's Barcelona Pavilion. And you can tell Mies was very much influenced by Frank Lloyd Wright's open plan. And so we see the kind of open flow of spaces in Wright's Prairie style and later here, the Sonian houses, and open flow of spaces. No, actually there's no enclosure here because it's a pavilion. So there are differences. Mies is using columns so that his walls are non-bearing. But that aside, what strikes us in, is, in the difference is that Mises is glass and steel and Wright's is wood and brick. And so we sort of feel wood and brick are more natural than glass and steel, although there's plenty of glass in Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture. So it's one of those things where we sort of know what we mean, but we really can't pin it down. But use of natural materials. Embodying the democratic American spirit. Now, here we mean democracy not in the, in the political sense. In other words, constitutional government and elections. But rather, what Wright means here is America developed a culture designed to enable flourishing of the individual spirit. That you as an individual can identify your interests and fulfill them. So individuality, opportunity, freedom from constraints. This is sort of what Wright means by the democratic American spirit. So again, let's contrast Corbu and Wright and on the left is Unidabitation, 
an apartment building by Corbu. Now, Corbu did plenty of houses, but very often those houses were meant to serve the client, but also very often notice that there's few or no windows on the sides because he thinks of these houses as prototypes for what would eventually become stacked units. In other words, he really does think in terms of apartment buildings, a very urban approach. Wright does one apartment building, but in general, Wright does individual suburban homes. And so Wright sees the individual, Corbu sees the society. Corbu has these complicated Skip Carter scheme. This is the downstairs of your apartment and then the upstairs goes all the way through. And here you have a balcony in your apartment and the downstairs goes all the way through. And what this does is allows you views in both directions, both the Mediterranean and the mountains, and allows for the through flow of air. Every apartment has exposures on both sides so that this is before air conditioning, so this gives you natural ventilation. But if you think of the slogan of the French Revolution, liberty, equality, fraternity, both Europe and America share those values, but the emphasis is a bit different. In America, it's a bit more on the liberty, and in Europe, it's a bit more on the equality. So if these are defining features of democracy, you, you still can have substantial differences in which one you emphasize. So everybody in Corbu's approach gets the same unit, so we all share a similar jail cell. <laughs> these little identical units. Whereas rights are spread out and generous and individual, each different for each different individual client. Again, this idea then that the American democratic society, American democratic ideal, allows the individual flourishing of each person. On the top, we have the Roby House by right, and on the bottom, the Hannah House, which is on a trihex grid. Next meaning we have for organic architecture is that it's an architecture of essences. Let's see what we mean by that. Wright says, what is honor? Not the rules of a code, but the nature of honor. What would be the honor of a brick? That in the brick which makes the brick a brick. Now, let's come back to this, but develop it a bit more. We said at the beginning of the course that Wright had worked for and really studied with Louis Sullivan. And Wright referred to Sullivan as Liebermeister, dear master. There are definite differences in the architectural approaches of Wright and Sullivan, but I would say on this issue of organic architecture, they're identical. So Sullivan wrote three books, and the last one is called A System of Ornament, and on the last page he has this image of a seed. So you look at that, imagine a peanut, and you split it open. And the two sides provide the food for the growing plant until the photosynthesis gets going, and the germ is what starts to grow. So this is the growing part, and this is just stony food. And Sullivan writes, the germ is the real thing the seat of identity. Within its delicate mechanism lies the will to power, the function which is to seek and eventually to find its full expression in form. Let's unpack this. The germ is the real thing, seat of identity. So seat of identity means there is an identity in that little germ. And I'm going to say by that he also means an essence. So what is this essence? What is this identity? He says it is the will to power. So this essence has or is a will to power. What does that mean? Does anybody know where we where else we see the term will to power? With whom do we associate that term? 
Friedrich Nietzsche uses the term will to power. In a crude way, that can be interpreted as a inappropriate desire to dominate. But in another way, we can see it as understanding the essence of all things. What do I want to do? I want to project my John Law Bellness. That's what I, you know, I want to find my identity and project it, maybe as a good teacher. So all biological entities, a plant, a lion, a cat, are seeking to project their identity. That's what Nietzsche means by will to power. Sullivan goes on, the function, so that will to power is a function, which is to seek and eventually find its full expression and form. I want to fully manifest my John Lobelness. A lion wants to fully manifest its lioness in its biology, in its physiology, in its shape, in its behavior. That means it wants to express itself in form. So let's, since we're talking about architecture, which doesn't have behavior, let's focus on the form. And Sullivan says, the office building must be every inch a proud and soaring thing. In other words, the office building wants to be a tall and soaring tower, just as we might say the acorn wants to be an oak tree. Now, if you're a materialist, you say, well, yeah, that's the DNA. So the DNA is a bunch of instructions that unfolds itself and leads to the acorn becoming an oak tree. So that would be a reductionist explanation, and this would be an explanation by analogy. Given this idea that there's this inner will in the germ to become an oak tree, in the office building to become a tall and soaring thing. Let's go forward and look at the architect Louis Kahn. Kahn says, if you're thinking of brick and you're consulting the orders, you consider the nature of brick. You say to brick, what do you want brick? So right away, that's making the assumption that there's this inner will, this desire. What do you desire, brick? The brick says to you, I like an arch. If you say to brick, arches are expensive and I can use a concrete lintel over an opening, what do you think of that brick? Brick says, I like an arch. In other words, there's a nature to brick, there's a way in which it's appropriate to use brick, and if you don't use it that way, brick feels shortchanged. Let's say you're doing a suburban house, it's a stud wall construction, and then you put a veneer of brick over it. What is that? <laughs> so you can pretend it's a solid brick house. No, it's a stud wall house. You just use the brick as a veneer. Why didn't you just get some linoleum with brick images on it and, and uh, staple gun that to the, to, the, to the plywood of the stud wall? It's very insulting to brick. As Khan likes to say, brick's built wrong. <laughs> you know, this is, this is, it's like, you're a talented designer, you go to an office and they say, oh, could you trace these drawings? Wait a minute, I went to Pratt for five years and I have all this debt so I can trace drawings? What is that? This is not universal. It's true of Wright, it's true of Sullivan, it's true of Kahn, that they believe there's this inner essence in materials and in the building itself. In materials, we say, well, steel wants to be used in tension, wants to be uh, elongated and attenuated. Concrete wants to be used in compression and be massive and squat. So that there's a nature to the material, you want to be respectful of that nature. Beyond the material, Kahn would say, what does this building want to be? So a new building comes into the office. And he would typically then bring the project to his studio at school and say, well, we just, we just got a commission to do a school. And he'd sit around in the studio and he would, he would say, well, what does, what does a school want to be? And he's like, what is the essence here? 
One time he had a boys club. I said, what does is, what is a boys club wants to, want to be? Someone said, a place to go out from. It's a place where you then go to the Museum of Natural History on a hiking trip. It's a place you go out from. Okay, it may or may not be right, but it's an insight which then gives us a notion of the nature of the building and an approach to our design. So we're doing a school. So, okay, suppose you say, this may sound pretty lame, but a school is a place where it's good to learn. So then you say, okay, it doesn't sound like a lot. I mean, isn't that obvious? But maybe it's a start. But then imagine you're with your son or daughter or niece or nephew. It's the first day of a new school, and you're walk walking them to school. You hold them by the hand, you're walking up to this building. And you look at the building and you say, this looks like a place where it's going to be good to learn. If not, that building fails. It doesn't matter, you know, with the square footage, the roof leaks, or it doesn't leak. If I'm looking at your student project and you're doing a school, that's the, you know, that's what I'm going to ask. I'm, I, maybe it's not a place of learning. Maybe it's, you have another idea. But what is that idea and how does your building manifest it? You have to start with that question. What does this building want to be? So now we go back to Wright. What is honor? What the hell does he mean by honor? And then he says, not the rules of a code. So there are two ways you can see morality. One is rules, the rules of a society, and other is your inner sense of right or wrong. And sometimes they don't agree. So he's saying, I don't mean the rules of society, not the rules of a code, but the nature of honor. In other words, the, your inner sense of right and wrong, or in this case, the inner sense of the brick, the honor of the brick. Now, what, what the hell is that? What's the honor of a brick? This is that in the brick, which makes the brick a brick. This is a theory of essences. The brick has an essence, and it's a quality which gathers to the brick its brickness. It makes the brick square, hard, red. It gathers the qualities of brickness to the brick. So in identifying that inner essence, Wright's word is honor, Sullivan's word is will to power, Kahn's phrase is the order of the brick or the nature of the brick. So from this point of view, organic architecture recognizes this inner essence of the material and of the building itself and is responsive to them. Now, interestingly, in Sullivan's case, where someone responds to him, wait a minute, how can a brick, which is an inanimate thing, desire anything, seek anything? It's inanimate. And he says, you're right until it comes into relationship with the architect. So in that sense, the architectural designer is like a midwife helping a process so that we don't want to negate the will of the designer, but that will of the designer should be working within the nature of the material, the nature of the building, and helping it become what it should become. And finally, we can define organic architecture in terms of a response to an organic worldview. So let's see what I mean by an organic worldview. So we'll go to a question that maybe should have been the first question in the first week. What is architecture? There is um, architecture is shelter. Architecture is building considered as art. Of course, then we don't know what we mean by art. So you can say architecture is the art of space. You can say it has something to do with function. So there's lots of possibilities. I'm going to say architecture is the crystallization of a culture in form. In other words, we have a, a notion of the Renaissance, the high Renaissance. Bramante's Tempietto is the crystallization of that notion in form. 
So that notion can be in books and literature and ideas and religious values. In, but if you want to put it in form, if you want to take all these cloud of ideas and they solidify, crystallize, the modern industrial notion crystallized in form might look like Mises' Barcelona Pavilion. So this is obviously very broad. Of course, architecture has to fulfill a function. It has to be have structural integrity. We can refer to Vitruvius' firmness shouldn't fall down. Commodity, it should be useful, delight, it should be beautiful. We can refer to all those things. But in the largest sense, architecture is a representation of the ideas of its time that when you emerge into a period, the Renaissance. Now, the Renaissance happened to be one that they were aware of, and they named it the Renaissance. But they don't always, but they feel there's something going on. Maybe you have to be a little bit older than you guys, because you just live in it. But there's something going on in our digital world here. <laughs> it's like, whoa. I mean, you just pick up your, your iPad or your phone and you're, to use the word, you're surfing through encyclopedias and databases and every TV show ever made and every image. And so let's take this one. Architecture is the crystallization of a culture in form. Now, am I justified in saying that, that I make that up? Let's see what Frank Lloyd Wright said. Frank Lloyd Wright said, Every great architect is necessarily a great poet. He must be a great original interpreter of his time, his day, his age. In other words, his culture. And as an architect, he, he interprets that into form. Mies said, architecture is the will of an epic, a culture, translated into space. An epic being like the Renaissance, the Baroque. Rome, Greece, the modern age, these are epics. And architecture translates these epics into space. Now, we mean form and material and the whole thing, <clears throat> but he's saying space. This is a slide I use regularly. I don't want to show the five great cultures of Eurasia. And each of them are symbolically totally different. So in China, what's important is the flow of nature. And what one should aspire to is to put oneself in harmony with that flow. And then if we look at Chinese architecture, Chinese culture, Chinese social values, like Confucianism, what is the natural relationship of father to son, son to father, father to daughter, daughter to father, father to emperor, emperor to citizen? What are all, what is the natural order of those relationships? And you want to put yourself in accord with that natural order. What's our response to that? Well, I'm going to do whatever I want. Don't give me anything what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> totally different attitude in the West. Okay. In India, this world is an illusion. The real world, the re real reality, is a transcendent oneness. One should seek to identify with that transcendent oneness. In the Middle East, a creator created the world and left an instruction book. The virtuous person is the one who most closely follows the rules in that instruction book otherwise known as the Bible, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Koran, etc. It's not who in their own imagination comes up with the most virtuous form of behavior. There's no freelancing here. You don't wing it. There are definite instructions. In Greece, we have the emergence of the individual, but that individual is seen as constrained by fate. What is the ultimate constraint of fate? 
what's the one thing that fate imposes on you that you can't escape? Bes besides taxes. <laughs> Death, right. Well, if you're interested later, go look at it online, timeship.org. I work on a project called Timeship. Our clients intend to be immortal. They've spent hundreds of millions of dollars to find genetic causes of aging, and they're going to turn it off. What's this death stuff? We've got to fix it. The West is the only culture that would have that, that attitude. In the West, we have the individual, but they work within an inner moral compass. Right and wrong has to come from inside you. So we see that in The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, or Mark Twain, where Huck Finn is helping the slave Jim escape, and he knows he's doing something terribly wrong because the preacher had told him it's wrong, Miss Polly had told him it's wrong, Miss Watson had told him it's wrong, but he's doing it anyway. And then he says, I'm doing something wrong. I'm going to go to hell. And then he says, all right, then I'll go to hell. I'm going to do it anyway. We know that his inner moral voice that's telling him to do this is more right than the social voice, which is telling him the wrong thing. So his inner, it is presented that his inner moral voice is superior judge of conduct and right and wrong than society's voice. That's a totally Western idea. You don't find that in any other culture. Let's now look at two of these cultures, the West and this inner moral voice. Culture begins by laying down its epic poem and its temple form. And in the epic poems of the West, the tales of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, which, is called, which are called the Arthurian Romances, there's a paragraph where the Holy Grail has appeared and veiled, and the knights vow to go on a quest to view the Holy Grail unveiled. And they take off on the quest, and they thought it would be a disgrace to go forth in a group. So each entered the forest at a point he himself chose, where it was darkest and there was no path or way. If there's a path, that's somebody else's path. It's not your path. And what do we demand of you in Design Studio? Originality. No plagiarizing. And we have the emergence of the individual. And this individual dominates nature. Now, this is so obvious as to be unfair, but which is, which is nature and which is the person? It's pretty obvious, right? I mean, it really jumps out in Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa. So the individual person comes forward, and nature is subsumed in the background. And then a home for this individual, putting the individual in the center in Palladio's Villa Rotunda. And it's as though at the center of an X, Y axis and a Z if we count the dome. So this Renaissance architecture marks an X, Y, Z center for the individual from which to stand and which then from where, from where to measure all things. So the Renaissance borrows from the Greek Protagoras the slogan, man is the measure of all things. And we need a reference point from which to do that. And we see how the building dominates the landscape puts the human being in the center. It's not a bad sighting of the building. It's beautiful sighting of the building. It's the most beautiful architecture just about among the most beautiful architecture ever done. It's Palladio's architecture. He's the most influential architect of all time. And, you know, Italy is just beautiful. And both the landscape and the architecture. But it's certainly putting us, human being, in the central position. In the east, so oh, that was the west. <laughs> now we'll do the east. 
So in the east, we see in Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching, important spiritual document for China. <clears throat> do you think you could take over the universe and improve it? I do not believe it can be done. The universe is sacred. You cannot improve it. And the idea is to be responsive to the flow of nature. The temple is open so nature can flow through it. And this becomes a model for how we should deploy our own lives. In Chinese and Japanese art, here a Japanese example, very often there are people, unlike Leonardo's Mona Lisa, they don't metaphysically pop. So here's some people. But we hardly see the architecture, much less the people. It's all integrated with the landscape. And so even if the people are small in a Western painting, the quality of the brushstroke changes so that they will metaphysically stand out, they'll metaphysically pop. In Asian art, the brushstroke is the same so that they will blend in. In Shinto, the notion is that there are spiritual qualities in nature. And so a Shinto shrine starts by identifying a spot that has a spiritual energy. And you mark it, but, but made this tree. So we put a rope around it, we put a little fence around it. And then we might later add a little temple so there's a place to put offerings for the spirit of that place. And the definitive Shinto shrine is Isi Shrine. All natural wood and fibers for the roof. No nails, no iron, because that would disrupt the flow of nature. And the wood is not finished, it's not varnished. And so it's going to rot. And here we see it's starting to decay, the screen mold growing into the roof. And every 20 years, we build a new one and then dismantle the old one. And this has been going on since the third century AD, <coughs> for thousands of years. And then Katsura Imperial Villa in Japan. We see a meandering asymmetrical plan responsive to the interior functions integrated with nature, the walls opening to allow an interpenetration of inside and outside, flowing spaces, including between inside and outside. So the contrast between East and West. In every Western tradition, we slay the dragon. Hercules slays the Hydra. All the Greek heroes slay dragons, rescue maidens, St. George slays the dragon. St. Patrick drives all the snakes out of Ireland. The dragon is symbolic of the natural energies of the earth. And we slay the dragon so that the human being can dominate the earth. In China, the dragon is venerated, not slain. So we have these two different attitudes. In the West, the person dominates the landscape in painting. In the East, the person is integrated with the landscape. In the West, the architecture dominates the landscape, puts the human being in the center. In the East, the architecture is integrated into the landscape and the human being is part of the flow of nature and not separated out and differentiated from it. So in the East, let's take the Tao Te Ching. Do you think it can take over the universe and improve it? I do not think it can be done. The universe is sacred. You cannot improve it. If you try to change it, you will ruin it. If you try to hold it, you will lose it. In the West, 
from Ray Kurzweil's book, The Singularity is Near. It may only take a quarter of a millennium to go from sending messages on horseback, it's 250 years, from sending messages on horseback to saturating the matter and energy of our solar system with sublimely intelligent processes. The ongoing expansion of our future superintelligence will then require moving out into the rest of the universe where we may engineer new universes. This is the poster for a conference I was at in June in New York, 2045, it's a group of Russian oligarchs that are building avatars into which they can download themselves so that they can escape biological mortality. This is Seth Lloyd's programming the universe. These guys, the universe is basically a quantum computer. We can reprogram it. And this is a project. I'm director of research for Timeship, which is a, a biotech facility for doing this stuff. Two very different attitudes <laughs> between about uh, the human relationship to the universe between East and West. So, here is on the left, Fellow Rotunda and its plan. In the middle, the Japanese Katsura Imperial Villa and its plan. And on the right, Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water and its plan. Which one does Wright look closer to? And I'm not going to say, but you know, something to think about. So, I've described the East and West as very separate, but maybe there are ways in which they're coming together. These two very separate attitudes toward the universe. There's been a continual flow of Eastern ideas into the West. 326 BC, Alexander the Great uh, goes into India, and Eastern ideas come back to Greece, influencing Neoplatonism and Christianity. In the 1700s, the British are in India and discover Sanskrit texts and Immanuel Kant's thing in itself uh, comes from that Sanskrit material, a lot of the ideas of Emerson and Thoreau. In the 1800s, uh, there's a lot of Japanese influence in the late 1800s on the West, including on Impressionist painting. 1893, a disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, Hindu saint, comes to the Chicago World's Fair, influences various movements, like the Theosophical Movement in the United States and Europe, and Wright sees a Japanese temple at the fair. 1905, Wright goes to Japan to buy Japanese prints. 1915 to 23, Wright is building the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo. 1950s and 60s, uh, the Beats and Norman Mailer, among others, are influenced by Zen Buddhism, brought back from Japan by returning World War II GIs. 1963, Chungum Trumpa Rinpoche is the first Tibetan spiritual master to come to the West in the 1920s to today. Quantum theory starts to look a lot like Eastern thought, and today uh, might we be on the verge of a second renaissance. So here is a Japanese painting, again with the, the people indistinguishable from the landscape, contrasted to a renaissance painting where the individual is quite distinguishable. Now here we are with Impressionism, Pissarro, and the people are really no different than the carriages, the horses, or the trees. In other words, they don't metaphysically pop, but the quality of the brushstrokes are the same for both, and this is a Japanese influence on Western art. In Buddhism, the notion is our universe is the sum total of all of the sentient beings that are in it. The universe is a field of the interlocking minds of all beings. Now here we are getting into 
the 20th century with relativity and quantum theory, and James Jeans, English physicist, says the universe begins to look more like a great thought than a great machine. And in quantum theory, John Archibald Wheeler says, no phenomenon is a real phenomenon until it is an observed phenomenon. In other words, our looking at it is inherent to what it is. So this is Robert Thurman, has a chair in Indo-Tibetan Studies at Columbia University and is a leading proponent of Buddhism in the West. He's a Buddhist monk, or was until he left to become secular again. And he suggests that we will experience a second renaissance. He says, the West mastered the outer world of material. The East mastered the inner world of mind. And the second renaissance, will be, we will bring these two together. So here are six worldviews in materialism. We are material creatures in a world governed by the laws of physics. Our consciousness is just firings of neurons. In the West, we are individuals, each unique, whose purpose is to fulfill our potential. In the Middle East, we are created by a creator who left instructions that we should follow. In India, in Buddhism, we are part of a universal consciousness. Separation is an illusion. In traditional China and Japan, we are a part of the flow of nature. We should put ourselves in accord with that flow. Where does right stand in here? So, in the West, we are unique individuals. Wright says, I believe that every man born had equal right to grow from scratch by way of his own power, unhindered to the highest expression of himself possible to him. Sounds totally Western to me. Wright also says, everything that's ever going to be of use to you in architecture or in life or anywhere you go or whatever you do is going to be nature in some of its immensely varied forms. Sounds pretty Eastern to me. So my conclusion, we got both. Wright writes, space, the continual becoming, invisible fountain from which all rhythms flow and to which they must pass beyond time or infinity.